He was the party prince. He was photographed incessantly falling out of one nightclub after another. Who rebelled against royalty. He decided he might leave the royal family. Haunted by his mother's death. It destabilized him and caused chaos for years. He struggled to find his way. Being royal for Harry was a burden and a curse. She's an American actress. I was like, OK, well, I really have to up, up my game. <laughs> Unlike any royal bride before. Let's go back a few generations, and everything about Meghan Markle disqualifies her from marrying Harry. A modern royal couple who will change history. The queen made an exception and broke from royal protocol. Redefine royalty. Do you see any scenario by which Harry and Meghan overshadow Kate and William? It was my first thought. And modernize the monarchy. The world's view of the British monarchy is probably going to be determined more by Harry and Meghan than by William and Kate, certainly by Charles and Camilla. That's a very unusual situation. Tonight, a CNN special report. A royal match, Harry and Meghan. I'd never, never even heard about her until this friend said, Meghan Markle, I was like, right, okay, give me, give me a bit of background. It is July 2016 in London, when Britain's most eligible bachelor, Prince Harry, is set up on a blind date. It was definitely yes. a setup. <laughs> it was a blind it date. Was. I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her, and there she was sitting there. I was like, OK, well, I'm going to have to up, up my game. <laughs> Harry ups his game, and they begin a whirlwind romance. Just weeks later, they're vacationing together in Botswana, Africa. We camped out with each other under the stars, and we spent come and join me for five days out there, which was absolutely fantastic. In the months that follow, they date long distance, meeting up in London and Toronto, where Megan, an actress, is filming her TV show Suits. Wow, you're pretty. Good. You hit on me. We can get it out of the way that I am not interested. No. The whole time, keeping their relationship a secret. I mean, when they first met, nobody knew about it. I mean, they are such a charismatic couple. They are Penny so Junior wrote a biography about Harry. They kept this relationship quiet. Which is itself impressive. It is impressive. I mean, the great fear about Harry finding a, a, a wife was always going to be the intrusion of the press, because that is what had killed two previous long-term relationships. Relationships with actress Cressida Bonus and his first love, Chelsea Davy. Chelsea had experienced the most horrible treatment. Photographers would be waiting for her. They would call out names, slag, bitch, whore, trying to get um, a reaction from her. And I guess that she looked at all of this and thought, do I want this for my life? And I interviewed Harry just before he met Meghan, um, the month before, and we talked about you know, his private life at the time. Harry tells Roya Nika, the royal correspondent for Britain's Sunday Times, about a, quote, massive paranoia he feels in finding a girlfriend. I think Harry's great fear was that unless he had enough time to get to know someone, if that relationship prematurely became public, they would be absolutely swamped with media interest, and that would change the dynamic of his relationship. And what happened to his mother is never far from his mind. Harry and his brother still feel that you know, the paparazzi and press intrusion were certainly partly responsible for his mother's death and thought, why would anyone want to put up with this for me? Harry wants to keep his relationship with Meghan private as long as he can. But just four months after that first date, the news is out and the paparazzi counts once again. I mean, there was a photographer who, who got inside Meghan's house in Toronto. The paparazzi were camping on her mother's front lawn and following, you know, and harassing all, all members of her family, anybody really who knew her. Despite starring in a TV show, Meghan is relatively unknown. Now the British press wants to know who she is and if she's fit for the royal family. She was a woman who had been married. People were fascinated by the fact that she was divorced. People were fascinated by her background, her acting, a career woman. How would that work, being with someone in the royal family? You know, that's not what we've seen before. 
They also have not seen someone biracial dating a member of the royal family. And some of the conversation is blatantly racist. There was one newspaper headline saying straight out of Compton, suggesting that she was from a, a gang-ridden neighborhood. Afwa Hirsch is a journalist and recently wrote a book about race, identity, and belonging in Britain. And would Harry be dropping around for tea in gangland, which was very clearly racially loaded. A whole other issue exploded, which was the number of rather horrific social media racist comments began to flood in from the darkest, vilest corners of the internet. The royal family responds in unprecedented fashion with Prince Harry's team releasing a statement confronting the, quote, abuse and harassment Meghan is facing. Very unusual for a statement to come out. No one understands this better than Dickie Arbiter. He was press secretary at the palace for 12 years. He made the point, this is not a game. It's not a game, it's people's lives. And he was very angry and it was a sort of back off reminder uh, to what they did to her, his mother. Why is it that you think that Meghan's upbringing, her race, why did that garner so much attention? In the past, members of the royal family, princes, would have married princesses. And when Harry's father, Prince Charles, was looking for a wife, it was also a requirement that, that a wife should be a virgin and a member of the Church of England. You just go back a few generations in the royal family, and everything that you can say about Meghan Markle disqualifies her from marrying Harry. Kate Coyne is the executive editor of People magazine. This is precisely why you had Edward abdicating his throne so that he could marry an American divorcee. Elizabeth's sister Margaret was in love with a divorced man and was not allowed to marry him. It wasn't Charles and Diana's wedding and marriage a wake up call in some ways for the monarchy that you can try to have somebody perfect, but it has to be chemistry and you have to let the person have the freedom to marry who they want. No, well, I think it was a, le a lesson that they've learned. Harry is desperate for history not to repeat itself. And he's anxious to protect Meghan. Harry's statement was the most romantic thing a member of the royal family has ever done. And I think Engagement Watch was on from that moment. It was, let's wait for the ring. <laughs> the ring comes in November 2017. Prince Harry has announced his wedding engagement to American actress Meghan Markle. And the royal family welcomes Meghan with open arms. The Queen made an exception and broke from royal protocol and invited Meghan to spend Christmas with the royal family and the Queen at Sandringham. That was the first time a royal fiancé has ever done that before actually marrying into the royal family. A powerful sign the monarchy and the Queen are modernizing and changing. The royal family now is trying to at least be much more reflective of society and the Queen first and foremost wants her grandson to be happy. And that happiness is something Harry has been searching for most of his life. When we come back, the moment that changes everything. He didn't really deal with what life without her meant. It destabilized him and caused chaos for years. September 15th, 1984. Prince Henry Charles Albert David is born. Harry came into the world very different to his brother, who was heralded as the next in line to the throne of England. But Harry was the spare. Paul Burrell was Princess Diana's butler. So all through Harry's formative years, he always knew that he was second. He was always referred to as the spare, just always second best. And I think that had a profound effect on Harry. His childhood is also impacted by his parents' marital troubles. Harry grew up in a very, very tricky household. The prince and princess were never happy together in a marriage that had failed before it even began. And I remember the times when Diana was shut away and quiet and, or crying, and the boys would write little messages, please don't cry, mummy. 
and they will put it under the door. When Charles and Diana divorce, it hits Harry hard. Then, one year later, his mother is killed. Harry is just 12 years old. This incredibly loving figure who had given him so much warmth and comfort in what was a very difficult childhood and extraordinary upbringing um, was suddenly gone. I remember Harry coming back to Kensington Palace shortly after the funeral when he ran down the corridor and flung himself into my arms and cried. And his tears wet my shirt through. He was devastated. Got the phone and, and Harry later admits to ITV he has deep regrets about his final phone call with his mother. I can't really necessarily remember what I said, but all I do remember is is probably, you know, regretting for the rest of my life the how short the phone call was. And if I'd known that that was the last time I was going to speak to my mother, the things that I would the things I would have said to her. Looking back on it now, it's incredibly hard. I have to sort of deal with that for the rest of my life. Guilt and grief he never expresses at the time. I think it was a classic case of don't let yourself think about your mum and the grief and the hurt that comes with it because it's never going to bring it back and it's only going to make you, make you more sad. People deal with grief in different ways. And my way of dealing with it was was by just basically sh shutting it out, locking it out. Prince Harry arrives here at Eton, the prestigious boys' boarding school, the year after his mother's death. And though he moves into the same house as his older brother, William, Harry reportedly struggles academically and is miserable. Diana always said that she never wanted Harry to go to Eton because he would be compared to his brother's success. And she thought this would be the undoing of Harry's confidence. Prince Harry said that he decided that he was going to be a bad boy. Journalist Angela Levin interviewed Harry last year at Kensington Palace. So that the reason he didn't do well there was partly his fault, it was deliberate. In 2002, headlines emerge of Harry's drinking and marijuana use. For the first time, Harry is facing the public pressure that comes with his famous family. Did it seem to Brits that it was more than just typical teenage antics? You know, teenagers do drink too much. They do behave badly. You know, it's all part of the growing up process. But I personally was worried that there was something deeper. There was a touch of self-medication going on. After graduating from Eton, Harry escapes to Africa during his gap year for humanitarian work. It was an escape from this heavy duty world of royalty, always being watched, always being photographed. He could be very ordinary. He spends two months in Lesotho with children in need and others whose parents died from AIDS. He could see that there were holes there in their lives. And I think absolutely he saw in them something that he felt was missing in his life, care, love and attention, the loss of his mother. Harry not only falls in love with the children and the country, he begins a serious romance with a wealthy girl from Southern Africa, Chelsea Davy. She is very free spirited, not someone who felt bound by royal protocol or tradition, and also shared his love of Africa. And, you know, the two of them traveled extensively throughout Africa together. Chelsea remains a constant in Harry's life for years to come. She also came into his life at a time when he was missing that female figure to support him. And I think Chelsea did that um, and understood him, and she could understand that he'd been through a very difficult time and was still going through a very hard time. A very hard time that Harry struggles to overcome. When we come back... Prince Harry got so low that he decided at one point that he might leave the royal family. And then Meghan Markle's struggle with her biracial identity. She has heard the names her mother has been called, and she's well aware that that is happening for one reason only, and it's the color of her mom's skin.
Meghan Markle grows up a world away from the pomp and circumstance of royal life. You hear that someone grew up in Los Angeles and you think about swimming pools and palm trees and Beverly Hills and Meghan Markle's childhood in LA was not that. Born in 1981, she is the only child of Doria Ragland and Thomas Markle. Meghan's father was a lighting director for a number of shows in the Los Angeles area, most notably married with children. He eventually became the director of photography, and that was the sort of behind the scenes, less glamorous side of Hollywood. Yeah. Meghan recounts spending time on the set with her father on the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson. Uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for 10 years. I was there. Wow. I know. It's a very perverse place for a little girl who went to Catholic school, no less, to grow up. Action. Meghan certainly had every reason to be dazzled by TV, film, the whole on-camera experience from a very young age because she grew up around it. We all knew she wanted to be an actress. Christine Knudsen is Megan's former teacher. She was in the musical, she was in the plays. She would sparkle when she got on stage. And I, I think it was just kind of in her blood. She loved it. Despite two loving parents, Megan struggles with her biracial identity. I think she was kind of grappling a little bit with the sense of her identity and trying to understand who she was. Josh Duboff is a senior writer for Vanity Fair who has covered Megan. Her father was white, her mother was black. She said when she would fill out forms, there wasn't always a bubble that fit her to fill in. She didn't want to circle the one that was implying that her mother you know, was more important than her father or vice versa. Megan's parents go out of their way to make sure she does not feel different, but special. Her dad gave her a sort of Barbie doll family in which there was a black mom Barbie doll and a white dad, Ken doll, and then a baby Barbie doll in each color. But even that kind of points to how difficult it is to be Megan at that age because the children were still either black or white. There was no biracial Barbie baby doll for Megan. While the Markle household deals with race head on, years of built up racial tensions in the country explode right in Megan's backyard. She was driving, I think, with her mom, and I think there was like debris, and she thought it was snowing, and then she realized it was actually the, the LA riots. Riots that erupt when four white police officers are acquitted in the beating of a black man, Rodney King. A moment Megan says impacts her at a young age. It definitely opened Megan's eyes to the fact that this was a world that was not always going to treat her fairly and was not always going to be kind to her or to her family. I was teaching here at the time and I think it destroyed kind of that feeling that LA is this wonderful place to live and you have all these different kinds of people and we all get along and then this just kind of smashed that. It's a grim reality for an 11 year old to face and one that would always be present. Megan witnessed her mother experiencing racism. She has heard the names her mother has been called and she's well aware that that is happening for one reason only, and it's the color of her mom's skin. Megan's early experiences with discrimination are not isolated to race. While watching TV advertisements for a class project, one commercial stands out to her. Women are fighting greasy pots and pans. In the ad, they implied that the product was just for women who were going to be at home doing the cleaning. 11-year-old Megan tells Nick News what she thinks. I don't think it's right for kids to grow up thinking these things, that just mom does everything. She was irate because she thought, you know, my dad does dishes. It's not just women who do dishes. Why would it be women across America? And she wrote a letter. So I was wondering if you would be able to change your commercial to people all over America. And wouldn't you know it, it worked. The gloves are coming off. People are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. It had to have been such wonderful reinforcement for her at such a young age 
that she could make a difference, that she could take a stand and have her voice heard and not be dismissed. When we come back, Prince Harry and the burden of royalty. She really did love him, but being with Harry and the huge circus that came with it was overwhelming for her. She didn't want to be a princess. I don't think any sane person wants to be a princess. Outrage around the world after Britain's Prince Harry shows up at a costume party. Dressed as a Nazi, threaded Nazi. And that just seems like a moment of extremely bad judgment. It was a moment of complete and utter thoughtlessness. You know, he was young, he was very troubled, and he was drinking far too much. And he was a bit of a loose cannon. At just 20 years old, Harry is earning a reputation as reckless and self-destructive. He was photographed incessantly after he left school uh, during a sort of gap year of wanting out of one nightclub after another. And he has a run-in with the paparazzi that leaves a photographer with a split lip. For many years, it was a real worry about what would happen to Harry because he didn't seem to want to be a royal. He really kicked against it. He wanted to be a normal human being. When Harry arrives at Sandhurst Military Academy in May 2005, the pressure is on to turn over a new leaf. He'd not had that discipline for so many years. People were concerned that Harry wouldn't find his way. Sandhurst is nothing like the lavish royal lifestyle that Harry has become accustomed to. And throughout the 44-week grueling training course, he's treated like every other soldier. It could be said it kind of knocks a bit out of you. General Lord Richard Dannett was chief of the British Army. In the early days, the first five or six weeks, when the training is really tough, it encourages people to rely on each other, to, get, to help each other. Harry is one of the guys, yet there are painful reminders he's still a royal. When his unit deploys to Iraq in May 2007, Harry is forced to stay behind. There have been a number of specific threats specifically aimed at Prince Harry. And it's for that reason that I've decided that the risk to Prince Harry is too great. I think when he was told he couldn't go, it was a really low point for him. I didn't sort of join the army thinking that I was never going to go on operations. It was very hard and I did think, well, clearly one of the main reasons that I'm not allowed to be, to be going is because of the fact of who I am. But months later, a secret deployment to Afghanistan gives Harry a taste of the front lines. As far as I'm concerned, I'm out here as a normal JTAC on the ground and not Prince Harry. It's very nice to be sort of a normal person um, for once. I think this is about as normal as I'm ever going to get. It was pretty much a turning point in his life, but I think he realized the seriousness of life, really rose to the um, responsibilities. But after 10 weeks on the ground, his mission is leaked and Harry is immediately evacuated. It wouldn't have taken the Taliban or others long to have searched around and perhaps found where he was. So there was a risk to him, but I think also if there was an increased risk to him, there was an increased risk to the other soldiers who were around him. And the only sensible and safe thing to do was to bring him back. He was very angry. To use the words of his private secretary, he was boiling mad and he sort of headed for the gutter. He, what did that look like? he started drinking very heavily. He was fed up with, with who he was. Who he was is also causing tension in his relationship with his longtime girlfriend, Chelsea Davy. She really wasn't that fussed at all by the trappings that came with Prince Harry. In April of 2011, Harry brings Chelsea here to Westminster Abbey for the wedding of his brother, Prince William, and Kate Middleton. There are one million people lining these streets and millions more watching on TV around the world. It's an intense spotlight that Chelsea struggles to cope with. You received the beat. Oh my God.
And actually she was very determined that that would not be her life and she wanted a career of her own and ultimately I think that was one of the things that ended their relationship. She, she didn't want to live inside the goldfish bowl. Harry does not either and he is determined to return to the battlefield. When he came to see me, he sort of sat rather slumped in a chair and said, the trouble is, I can't be like a normal young man. But that time in Afghanistan had given him 10 weeks to be a normal young man, and he desperately wanted to replicate that again. And he accepted, and his private secretary accepted, that probably the only way he could go back was within the anonymity of being inside a helicopter. And he'd therefore need to learn to fly a helicopter. After two years of training, Harry not only becomes an Apache pilot, he is the top gun on his weapons course. He got it on his own. It wasn't because he was a prince. He actually had to fight really hard for it. He was one of the very top Apache attack helicopter pilots. Harry returns to Afghanistan in September 2012. He did exceptionally well. Brigadier Neil Sexton was Harry's commander on the ground. You go out there with the anticipation of having to use the Apache's weapon systems and to bring them to bear without any collateral damage and also uh, to conduct yourself in a way that's safe in the most demanding of environments. I actually believe that his success on that Apache, on those Apache aircraft, was the, the making of Harry. I think Harry, who had spent all his life being second best to his brother, being the spare, suddenly found something that he could do and could do better than anybody else. And that gave him confidence that he had never, ever had before. And he just, it, it changed him, I think. When Harry leaves the army after 10 years of service, his future is uncertain. I don't think there are any career options for a royal prince. It's easy for William. He's heading towards the throne. I think being royal for Harry was a burden and a curse because he was only the spare. What was his job? What was his way forward? As Harry finds his way, another romance is on the rocks. This time with his girlfriend of two years, Cressida Bonus. She really did love him. But I think the situation of being with Harry and the huge circus that came with it was overwhelming for her. I think Cressida took one look at what life with Harry would have involved and just turned her back on it. You know, she didn't want to be a princess. I don't think any, any sane person wants to be a princess. Who would want to be a royal princess? It's a burden. When we come back, Harry opens up about his royal role. He's living this life that he's been born into. It's not his choice. He decided he might leave the royal family. And then Meghan Markle's big break. She got lucky. She undoubtedly handed in a great audition, a great screen test, and she hit the jackpot. After graduating from Northwestern University, Meghan Markle moves home to Los Angeles. She's eager to chase her acting dreams, but the industry is tough. That is an industry that is built on judging you and tearing you down and rejecting you and making you second guess your weight and your skin and your hair and your talent and your poise. It's brutal, it's brutal. Harvey Young was Meghan's acting professor in college. When you leave college, uh, it's a pretty bleak world of just laying bare your soul as part of audition before a casting agent, uh, and then more often than not being told no. For Megan, her identity struggle is magnified in Hollywood. What has she said about how her race impacted her getting jobs? Casting agents weren't always sure what to make of her. Do, is she going out for a Latina role? Is she uh, somehow maybe Italian or even Middle Eastern? Or is she African American? Is she Caucasian? She undoubtedly felt like at times casting agents just threw up their hands and went, oh, never mind. Passed over for big roles, Megan does get some small parts. Thank you. So what's going on here? What do you mean? What I mean is like you're way too cute to be just a FedEx girl. But maybe she'd have one scene or be there for one moment. I think she was on a bunch of TV shows, uh, Fringe, Beverly Hills 90210. 
She was famously a deal or no deal girl. Uh, she had her little moment opening one of the briefcases. She has said that her 20s were brutal. Megan struggled a lot. To become a successful actress, to be able to make a living, that's like winning a lottery ticket. I mean, the number of forces that have to combine to get you even the smallest scrap of success are, are so astronomical. Megan auditions for 10 years. And then, at 29, she lands a significant role. Female lead on USA Network's legal drama, Suits. Is this all a joke to you? Because I take my job seriously. She got lucky. She undoubtedly handed in a great audition, a great screen test. She had excellent chemistry with her co-stars, and she hit the jackpot. Suits is an instant hit. Suits radically changed Megan's life. First and foremost, she was now making more money than she had ever made before, ever. As the show achieves success, Megan makes big changes in her life, including ending her two-year marriage to Hollywood producer Trevor Engelson. When they met, she was still largely an aspiring actress. He was an aspiring producer. They were essentially at the same place in their careers. Uh, and then Suits really took off, and uh, they weren't going in the same direction anymore. She was filming in Toronto. He was in Los Angeles. There were thousands and thousands of miles between them. Determined to use her position for good, Megan spends her free time advocating for women. I During a panel speak. discussion, Megan recounts how the success of the show emboldened her to stand up for herself. Every script seemed to begin with, Rachel enters wearing a towel. And I said, nope, not doing it. At a certain point, you feel empowered enough to just say no. She wanted to encourage other women to feel like they could speak up in the same way. And Megan uses her fame to fight for women's equality across the world. As an ambassador for the nonprofit World Vision, Megan travels to a remote village in Rwanda, where young girls walk hours every day to access clean water for their families. This is the water that she's going through all this work to get. But all that changes when the World Vision team builds a new well. These girls are able to stay in school because they aren't walking hours a day to go and get water. And this clean water source has changed the entire community. She has a sense that if she's been given a platform, if she has some influence, that there's a responsibility she has to use that for good. Laura Dewar is the Chief Marketing and Development Officer for World Vision. And she travels with Megan to India in January of 2017. They visit local businesswoman Suhani Jalada in Mumbai, where the lack of sanitary products and the stigma around menstruation keeps young girls out of school. Suhani's created a business where they make maxi pads. They manufacture them, and then she has a team of effectively salespeople that go door to door talking to women about how they handle uh, menstruation. Megan comes home and writes an essay in Time magazine drawing attention to the barriers to education for girls across India. And she continues to mentor Suhani to this day. She's really more than happy to, you know, have a, have a call and just talk about the issues that we might be experiencing or any help that we need from her, whether it's in terms of fundraising, in terms of marketing, or, you know, any kind of support like that. This is not a celebrity who floats in, who needs a platform issue to associate with their quote-unquote brand. This is a woman who's had a desire to help in some way for a very long time promote the faces and stories of women and to begin to elevate them. When we come back, Harry and Meghan and the future of the monarchy. Do you see any scenario by which Harry and Meghan overshadow Kate and Oh, William? yes, I do. It was my first thought. This could be a problem. Summer 2017. It's been 20 years since Princess Diana's death, and Prince Harry 
is speaking about it for the first time in a documentary for the BBC. When you're that young and something like that happens to you, I think it's, it's, it's lodged in your heart and your head and it, and, it, and it stays there for a very, very long time. For nearly two decades, Harry says he held back his grief. He didn't really deal with what life without her meant, I think, for a very long time. And then when he did finally confront it, it destabilised him and caused chaos for years. I spent a long time in my life with my head buried in the sand, you know, thinking, I don't want to be Prince Harry, I don't want this responsibility, I don't want this role. Um, you know, look what's happened to my mother. You know, why, why does this have to, have, have to happen to me? Harry even considered a drastic move. Prince Harry got so low that he decided at one point that he might leave the royal family. He's living this life that he's been born into, it's not his choice. Um, and I think he felt at times very cross about that. Did Diana's death affect Harry differently than William? Harry was that much younger and interestingly enough, last year he admitted for the first time to mental health issues. And you can't help but having a mental health issue in, in terms of having lost uh, a parent, not being able to grieve in the same way as you or I might be able to do. He wasn't able to do that, so he bottled it all up inside him. Now, Harry is letting it all out, sharing his struggle as part of his Heads Together campaign with Prince William and Kate to end the stigma around mental health. I never really talked about um, losing a mum at such a young age. I always thought to myself, you know, what's the point in bringing up the past? It ain't gonna change it, it ain't gonna bring her back. And when you start thinking like that, it can be really damaging. And Harry ultimately chooses a future he hopes would make his mother proud. I felt an overwhelming connection to many of the children I met. Something he shared with the BBC. Now all I want to do is, is try and, you know, fill the holes that my mother has, has left and that's what it's about for us, is trying to make a difference and, and in making a difference, making her proud. He spends much of his time working on the charity he created for the children he met in Lesotho, Africa. You look at Harry's work with um, HIV and AIDS, that was something that his mother, as Harry said, you know, smashed through the stigma of that when she was alive. And he's focused on the Invictus Games, an Olympic-style competition he started to give wounded veterans a chance to be defined by more than their injuries. It's life-changing. It really is life-changing for them. I think he has used his own experience of loss and sadness and bereavement to help these soldiers. And the bereavement doesn't just mean losing someone, it means losing yourself, I think, too. He's embraced who he is. It took him a long time to get there, but he now fully understands that being Prince Harry, he can make people's lives better by putting his name to things. He's making a difference. Through it all, Harry has endeared himself to the public, becoming one of the most popular members of the royal family. Harry is incredibly likable, and he is incredibly genuine. What you see is what you get. He is so natural with people, much more, I think he's the most natural member of the family. He throws out the rule book. And that makes him enormously valuable to the monarchy. The courtiers at Buckingham Palace used to say, what are you going to do about Harry? And now they're saying, what are you going to do with Harry? Because Harry is a magic bullet.
As Harry helps carry the monarchy forward, he will continue to do things his own way, like proposing to the woman he loves, not someone British royalty might expect. I think it's a wonderful coincidence that Harry has fallen in love with somebody who is American, mixed race, divorced, and a career woman. She is very representative of our society today, and I think that makes the monarchy much more um, user-friendly. And in Meghan, Harry has found someone who can cope with the role and is not afraid of the spotlight. Meghan was utterly enchanting when she appeared for the first time in Nottingham. She behaved as though she'd been doing it all her life. On Saturday, May 19th, Harry and Meghan will get married here on the grounds of Windsor Castle in St. George's Chapel. It will be a very traditional wedding for this very modern royal couple. Megan and Harry love story is a terrific story. It has unlimited fairy tale appeal. I heard you were amazing in Chicago. She does what she feels comes naturally. And Harry is the most relaxed member of the royal family. Do you see any scenario by which Harry and Meghan overshadow Kate and... Oh, Meghan? yes, I do. I do. I mean, this is... Immediately was my first thought. You know, th this, this could be a problem because... Harry and Meghan are a very compelling couple. They're very charismatic and very relaxed and easy. The cameras will follow them. William and Kate are, there's a much more rigidity to them, as possibly there has to be because he is going to be king. To some who have known the family well, Harry and Meghan will play a critical role in the monarchy's future. The world's view of the British monarchy is probably going to be determined more by Harry and Meghan than by William and Kate, certainly by Charles and Camilla. That's a very unusual situation. The royal family need Harry to bridge the gap between the people and the monarchy, because without that connection, the royal family wouldn't survive. As he has his whole life, Prince Harry will likely continue to be a star in the royal show with his irresistible appeal, down-to-earth charm, and, like his mother, a natural ability to connect. With Meghan by his side, this modern royal couple are on course to redefine Britain's most famous family and change the monarchy forever.